and then the you know the concepts so that we can get the right foundation to understand um we a lot of people tend not to understand what ai is but it's about machines or algorithms mimicking human intelligence it's just intelligence demonstrated by machines so that means everything about ai is about intelligence so if you don't understand intelligence then how can how can you be how can you say you're involved in um, ai so ai is simply machines that mimic cognitive functions that is normally associated with humans you know uh like you know the human mind you know things like problem solving and learning okay so most of what we're going to talk about today is about the human mind you know how to emulate it the ai challenge you know everything we talk about ai today is all about trying to understand man as a machine it's fundamental you can't understand ai if you don't understand this simple stick sentence and it's about understanding man as machine ai's aim is to you know arrive at the general theory of intelligent action in agents now first word now agent so let's understand what an agent is an agent is something that is capable of intelligent behavior so it could be you know robots software algorithms blah 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 physical agent which is one type of agent uh, you know uh, it's what you know we can physically touch you know like robots okay they are physical devices that interact with the physical uh, uh, environment then we have the virtual uh, agents which are software based and they occupy virtual environment which mostly happens inside computing system okay so those are agents agents capable of intelligent behavior right so ai uh, is is a general theory for intelligent actions by agents so ai attempts to understand mechanisms behind human and animal cognition which are covered by the following disciplines psychology philosophy linguistics and neuroscience so everything we want to know about ai is about these four subjects it's key that we understand this thing so the logic the mathematics the statistics the vectors name it is all about interpreting psychology philosophy linguistic neuroscience so that's the foundation of ai if you don't know these things, then you don't know AI. So we are going to talk a lot about this and then build to understanding uh, what uh, knowledge uh, graph is all about. Okay. So any significant discovery in this subject, that's psychology, philosophy, linguistics, and neuroscience will impact the development of AI. So any changes that happen there will automatically show you know, in the mathematics and in the logic. This is why we have masters and PhD programs, you know, research. That's all, that's all that happens. So that's the AI challenge. We need to understand it. Okay, uh, I'm going to start with this word by an AI expert, which says there's no intelligence in AI. There's no intelligence in artificial intelligence, or at least not in its current incarnation which is really just statistics or mathematics on steroids. This person is making a point, intelligence. So let's, you know, double into what intelligence is since we are all in, in that AI thing. So what's intelligence? Intelligence is the capacity of logic, understanding, self-awareness, learning, you know, emotional knowledge, reasoning, planning, creativity, critical thinking, and problem solving. That's intelligence. So the question is, are we doing things on intelligence in our AI activities? Because if it's not intelligence, then it's not AI, okay? So intelligence, again, is the ability to perceive or infer information and to retain it as knowledge to apply towards adaptive behavior within any environment or context. Ability to perceive or infer information, 
information. That's what we humans do, intelligence. Remember, AI is about mimicking human intelligence. What do human intelligence, uh, what happens uh, 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 humans with intelligence is that the ability to perceive or infer information, retaining as knowledge, the retained knowledge is what we call common sense, we'll come to it. So let's talk about human intelligence. Is the intellectual prowess of humans. It enables humans to remember description of things and use those descriptions in the future. So the things we learn today, we are going to use it today. What we learn, the basic facts and truths about our environment is what we call common sense. So when we use, learn common sense today, we apply it tomorrow. So that's from human intelligence. So that means we should be building artificial intelligence with the same capability or that mimics human intelligence. So, cognitive abilities to learn from, you know, concepts, understand, apply logic, reason, reasoning, reasoning, human intelligence does, okay? So, the capacity to recognize patterns, comprehend ideas, plan, solve problems, make decisions, retain information, and use language to communicate. Very key, that last point, use language to communicate. So how do you want agents, remember we've defined agents, both physical and virtual, to communicate their intelligence. We humans or animals already communicate our intelligence. I'm communicating my intelligence to all of you. And you're taking that intelligence, creating your common sense, updating your common sense, and then using that common sense for your future use. This is intelligence at work. So remember, we are about to, we are about to apply this in agents. So from human to agent. But you know, we need to understand the human intelligence first. When humans learn, this is what happens and this is what happens today at this moment as you're listening to me. When we learn, we connect patterns. They identify high order semantic abstractions of underlying objects and activities. That's what is happening today. So I'm talking about intelligence. Some of you might not have heard some of the things I've said, but it's connecting to something that you already know. Those things that you already know are objects or some of them could be actions. Okay, semantic abstraction is higher meaning. Okay, so that's what we are learning. So, and we are connecting gaps in our minds. Now, look at how my hand is moving. We are connecting gaps in our mind. We have some information you already know. There are some information I'm bringing that you need to add to your own information to create a bigger picture. We are coming towards that. So in turn, our background knowledge and experiences give us necessary context. That's the OIC moment about those patterns and identify the ones most likely to re re represent robust, actionable knowledge. This is how our minds work. I need us to understand this because this is where we are going to. In this, we are still talking about knowledge graph. So for you to understand what knowledge graph is all about. If, if, if you don't understand the mind, you can't understand knowledge graph. This is reason increasing intelligence. It's one of the goals of national educational systems. Unfortunately, we're in Nigeria. Our educational system has not been tuned to, um, for the knowledge economy. But this is a digression from where we are going to. So uh, somehow I left it here. We understand, but it's key. Okay, so in uh, humans, we have three types of reasoning. We have deductive reasoning, we have inductive reasoning, we have abductive reasoning. So uh, deductive reasoning is when we make inference based on accepted facts or premises. So this is where again we 
we make deductions based on our common sense uh, knowledge that we have. So that means we have knowledge somewhere stored. Key, we need to understand this concept. Knowledge needs to be stored so that we can use it to make deductions later. Okay, so that's deduction reasoning. Induction, inductive reasoning is making an inference based on observation. Observation is what we see with our five senses. Abduction is making a probable uh, uh, conclusion from what we know. So based on our knowledge and experience. So these three reasoning, we're coming to it, is that your AI system or your agent that has that exhibit intelligent behavior must be able to reason. Now, I need us to understand where we are right now. So reasoning, semantic abstraction, background information, storage, communication of intelligence, language. These are the things that we need to exhibit, all right? The human intelligence is really critical, all right? Okay, so this is how psychologists define intelligence. I'm putting this here for people to understand. Remember the statement, what AI is all about is trying to understand psychology, physiology, neuroscience, and linguistics. If that is what AI is, it's not science. <laughs> it's liberal science. It will shock everyone. Yeah, it's liberal science. That's what all this thing is all about. But science is trying to model it with logic, mathematics, statistics, you know. So this is how psychologists define intelligence, the ability to recognize problems, ability to solve problems, and ability to learn. This is something you would love to want, you know, to have an understanding the way psychologists are thinking, all right? Now let's talk about cognitive process. It refers to processes, you know, the thinking, the knowing, remembering, judging, problem solving. These are things unique to animals and humans, okay? Involved in gaining knowledge and comprehension or understanding. So these are high level functions, okay? And this is what we want our agents. This is what we want our agents to have. So whether it's a physical agent as robot or a virtual agent as your algorithm, we are talking AI and we are heading to knowledge graph. Intelligence is the ability to apply knowledge. Now, so I'm going to break it down. Intelligence is the ability to apply knowledge. Intelligence, knowledge. Knowledge is a collection of skills, information a person has acquired through experience. So that one you can understand, okay? It is that information that we have acquired over time that when we apply makes us intelligent, okay? Intelligence enables human beings to remember the description of things and use those descriptions in future behaviors. This you can align with. What you are thinking, most of you are thinking, is how we are carrying this to AI. Intelligence of man cannot be different from intelligence of machines. If you have a problem with that statement, you don't need to be in this class. We, we, are, we are going to exhibit, my job is to show you that machines can exhibit that intelligence. And we've already started doing it. So the simplest way to be smart, you know, when we say people are smart, remember we talk about smart things, smart system, smart cities and all that, okay? Um, I have talked about smart cities, not being about technology. It's about intelligence, okay? So we need to understand basic. So we can't be throwing words like smart. Smart, the simplest way to be smart is to build deep knowledge about something. You are smart about something, you have a deep knowledge about something. Okay. And when you show, you know, passion about it, it makes you smarter, you know, makes you understand yourself well, 
and you can share you know, that knowledge. So building knowledge of an area improves your memory, your thinking, we all know this, decisions about that area, okay? Knowledge fades as techniques and technologies come and but intelligence sustains it, yeah. Because there are a lot of things we know, sometimes we might not remember. That's the thing. But the ability to apply that knowledge, call it up. Remember, knowledge is taught somewhere in our minds. Being able to call it up, that's where intelligence comes in. You think the guy that is a dollar doesn't know this thing. It's just that it's taught so far in his mind that he can't find it. So when you're asking him the question, he doesn't remember. Okay, so let's go to what we call the data pyramid now. Well, this is a progression and I need us to understand where we are heading to is artificial intelligence. So this is the data pyramid. So now we're going to break everything down to data. So if you look at this pyramid, this is very critical. I learned this is what made me understand uh, one of the things that made me understand AI, okay? You can't talk of AI without talking of data. So data is the fuel of AI. If you don't understand data, you can't understand AI, okay? So if you look at uh, the data pyramid, there are standard four elements. So you have the data, you have the information, you have the knowledge, then you have the wisdom, okay? A lot of us are operating on the data layer. We call those things signals, information, observations. These are the things that we see, we pick up. They are not processed. When we add context, it, it becomes information. When we add meaning to it, it becomes knowledge, something we can use and apply. And then when it becomes actionable, it becomes wisdom, okay? We'll break it down. Let's start with what is data. It, this definition, everybody needs to, this is the simplest definition. Data is how we express observation in, reuse, in reusable form. Observation, being able to perceive things with your senses, five of them, that's data. So data is not, numbers, strings, or data is anything that you can describe. It's not statistics. It's not numbers. It's also words. It's also symbols. So data is anything I can observe. This is fundamental of science. This is fundamental of science observation, OK? So what is observation? Observation is the perception of relationship between entities. So what is it that we are trying to observe? Use the word entities. If you haven't heard of the word, it's the same thing as that word in English called noun, name of anything, animal, place, or thing. Entities. Entities are the things you are interested in. Humans, things, place, you know, name it. Entities is key. In AI, entities is what we want to understand. Entities, abstract terms, anything that has a name. So these are fundamentals we need to understand. Entities are key. So any, anything that has a name, we want to understand the relationship. Like here I'm in my sitting room, I can see my TV, I can see my fan, my AC. My observation is about, oh, my TV is black, my fan is working, Oh, my curtain is open. You understand? These are observations. It's very key. It's fundamental of data. You know. So anything I want to describe. I know a lot of you have machine learning experience. So when you are creating your data or the data that you are using for your models, it's supposed to be about entities. It's all about entities. But what you're going to get out of here is that data can be 
process, you know, on a to a, a more sophisticated level, relationships. Okay, so data is acquired by observing basic, you know, individual items of numbers or other information. Data is a collection of facts. Facts are, you know, things that exist, you know, in raw or organized form, such as in numbers and characters. Again, it's not only about numbers, but it's also about words. Data represents a fact or a statement of event without relation to other things. So we can use the data to give answers to simple things like who, when, where. Who is about human beings, when is an event, and where is that location. So simple things, oh, I, my car is parked outside. That's a weird location. It's parked somewhere. That's data. Okay, at this moment in time, I'm giving a lecture on knowledge graph. Oh, I just identified my neighbor. That's a who. So I can answer questions of who is my neighbor. It is this kind of data that we can use for simple things as chatbots. Question and answering in chatbots, but you know, we'll get there. Information is con conveyed. So we're moving up the pyramid now. Information is conveyed through context of data and data combination. Data is more powerful when you connect one to another. Very powerful. If you don't know this, <laughs> then it, there's a whole lot you don't know. The most powerful data are those that easily connect so that it creates a bigger picture. It adds to the meaning to create more understanding. So here, data is processed and organized in a way that exposes relationships. That's something we're about to talk about, relationships. Key, hold that word, is very key. Relationship, how are data related? For some of you in who are the machine language, uh, you, you're, you have a lot of rows and columns. You need to understand uh, the relationships between those columns. You'll find out that some relationships are explicit, some relationships are implicit, okay? Some relationships are artificial. You don't even know whether they are related, sir. But relationship is, is, is very, very, Okay, so information is data that has been given meaning by way of relational connection. So meaning coming from adding context. Context is critical in AI. Context is critical for us as human beings. Context matters <laughs> as human beings. So it should matter for your agents, physical or virtual agents. Information is data that has been given meaning by way of relational connection. This meaning can be useful, but does not have to be. We'll get to that. So by organizing associated data points together, we can provide answers to what is. So these are the connections we make at the information layer, more understanding of data, okay? So if you look at this map here, you see that meanings are added at the information layer, more meanings. We'll talk about that. Okay, so knowledge. Knowledge is the general understanding gained from accumulated information or experience. We've talked about it. So that a new background can be envisaged. When we go through things in life, we are adding to a database that is stored in our minds. Database in your mind. So when you claim that you're building an AI, system intelligence remember we are the ai now let's forget about the artificial let's talk about intelligence so if you are building an intelligent system does your intelligent system have where it stores past knowledge or knowledge it gains from now store it so that you could use it all right so knowledge is the appropriate collection of information and it is considered to be of great use or to be useful. When people memorize info, they amass knowledge. When we are taught in school, we amass knowledge. This knowledge has useful meaning to them, but it does not provide for 
in or uh, of itself an integration such as would infer further knowledge. So the knowledge you absorb in right now doesn't mean that it's, it's enough to infer new knowledge. It doesn't mean. It might not even be useful to your previous knowledge that you have in your database in your mind. But maybe the information you get tomorrow might now be useful to that and use it to infer new knowledge. But you know, that's the whole idea. So we use knowledge to answer the how question. How is this? How does this work? How does this? So this is higher abstraction. All right. Wisdom is an extrapolative and non-deterministic uh, uh, and non-probabilistic process. It's very key. That probabilistic process is key. It's not about probability. We are sure this is will happen. This is what you need. There's no probability. You are sure. That's wisdom. You are sure. It comes upon all previous love, uh, uh, previous levels of consciousness. By assessing and understanding acquired knowledge, we infer what we did not know before. So it's all about using up everything that we know and we now start bringing up ideas, concepts, and answers. And we can provide answers to why is this thing happening? Why? The, all the why questions. Why questions are the curiosity questions. The why questions is where the answers to a lot of our problems are. So in summary, the first three categories relate to the past and they deal with what has happened to so experience, OK, and what is known, real world facts. Wisdom deals with the future because it incorporates vision and design. With wisdom, people can create the uh, future rather than grasp the present and the past. This is where we find you know, smart people who make predictions, who will tell you that this is how things will work out to be. Yeah, and we all say that they are very experienced. That's the word, they are very smart. All right, so, um, Back, this will be our last uh, data pyramid. So a summary, you'll find out that the bottom half of the pyramid is all about noise. There's so much noise. So we see a lot of observation. A lot of those things might not be useful. Yeah, we, you know, we double into a whole lot of content, a lot of data. The noise level is very high. But we sift what we really need by operating in the upper end, okay? Now, we, we can look at it from this point. Data science has to do with what goes on at the bottom side. Knowledge engineering has to do with what goes on. So data science is bringing out all the data and sifting out, and getting all the facts and all that, moving towards the top. Knowledge engineering is trying to bring what we already know and tie it up with what is coming from under. So that's this shows a relationship between knowledge engineering and data science. Both ways, we need everybody on board for artificial intelligence. So now let's talk about AI today. The original AI is set to play is AI or narrow AI. Applied AI and narrow AI. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> Nepa has struck. Okay. Applied AI um, is shallow. So it has no knowledge. Um, it's greedy. It needs a lot of data. 
okay? So AI today doesn't have a lot of knowledge. So that background knowledge I was talking about, okay? is greedy because it needs a lot of data for them to understand something very small. It shouldn't be. When human beings uh, try to understand things, we, we don't need to be told so many things. You understand? So we need to make our AI to be like that. Now, again, it does not transfer easily from one application area to another. It breaks down quickly with even the tiniest changes in data. So we cannot move that narrow AI, for example, like machine learning, we cannot move what it learns from one application and push it to another application. It's not. For it to move to the other application, you need to run the same algorithms again. So to get to that original dream, we need to supplement the current statistical AI, okay? With what we call semantics and world knowledge, all right? So semantics is meaning, meaning. World knowledge is, you know, what we already know, common sense. AI must have common sense, all right? So if you look at the screen, this screen tells you about the two types of approaches to AI. I think there's a screen on this much later. I should have brought it earlier. So some people, there's a lot of misinformation. You know, every time we talk about AI, all you hear about is machine learning and deep learning. It's totally wrong, totally wrong. 90% of what is being written is that machine learning and deep, uh, and, um, and, uh, deep learning is a type of AI. It is wrong. Machine learning is an approach to AI, just like knowledge representation. You see that we have uh, uh, very high, but machine learning, very good at perception. Machine learning includes deep learning. Deep learning is a type of machine learning. So remember I said approach to AI is knowledge representation and machine learning. So now, um, learn, um, yeah, so machine learning is learning very good. Abstracting is poor, reasoning is poor. But if we combine these two, both knowledge representation and machine learning would go to that general representation. These are the approaches to AI, knowledge representation and then machine learning which includes deep learning, all right? Okay, so to make it intelligent, you know, we'll talk about relationships in data, you now understand how we can achieve intelligence. So, and then the most importantly, the meaning of data that has to have meaning, okay? If it doesn't have meaning, then how does it know what it's, it's doing? It's critical, that's intelligence, okay? So in such a way that AI seemingly intelligent conclusions and dis decisions are sensible to the real world. The human el element, the implicit knowledge we are built over time through experience that we are not even aware of. It's what allows us to make decisions and carry out much of our day-to-day -day activities. So how do we make tacit human knowledge into something explicit and repeatable that a machine will understand? This is where we're going to now. How are we going to make human knowledge understandable by machines? That's intelligence. 
All right. Okay. So here we are. What brings us today? Knowledge graph. Now, one easy fast way for organization to take the steps from data to information to knowledge to wisdom. Remember the pyramid is to use a technology we call the semantic technology. These technologies create links between disparate data, remember data at the bottom, and inferred knowledge out of context, out of facts, and achieve actionable decisions. That's the pyramid. But we already have a technology that can make you have that whole concept in one. So the question you ask yourself is, why are we not using the data pyramid in our narrow AI? That's what Data Science Nigeria wants me to come here to tell everybody. We are moving our AI prowess to the next level here in Nigeria. Everybody has to know this. So that's why I'm here to tell us that, you know, we can create intelligence out of uh, anything because we have an understanding of what intelligence is all about. So knowledge allows us to start emulating functions of the human mind. Knowledge combining it with computing power of machines to extract real meaning from our data. Whether the data is on the internet or in our enterprise or in our community. So armed with this knowledge, organizations can climb the mountain of wisdom and gain competitive advantage by supporting their business decisions with data-driven analytics is the mind of the people. Machines to emulate the mind of the people. Think about that for a minute. Now, Gartner, you as you know, one of the top tech consultants, understood the importance of knowledge graph uh, AI. And he wrote this in the hype cycle for AI in 2018. The rising role of content, content, content and context, content, context for delivering insights with AI technologies, as well as recent knowledge graph offerings for AI applications have pulled knowledge graphs to the surface. So now we've I've been doing knowledge graph since 2011, but a lot of people now are beginning to hear about it. I built the first knowledge graph in Africa, uh, which was about, you know, uh, um, music in Africa and also about movies. I think I have a screenshot of it here. So it's not getting popular because people are now seeing that we can't achieve AI without being smart, without being intelligent, okay? So if you look at the hype cycle of emerging technology for 2018, you see knowledge graph is here. I wish I had something from the latest one, but I think knowledge graph has moved to this point as of 2020. But now we are talking about intelligent organization, which is at the core of uh, this, but it's because I don't want us to digress. I didn't want to bring that, but the point here is to tell you here, like today now, knowledge graph is somewhere here in 2020, is to tell you the importance of knowledge graph. And that's why it's serious. Okay, so by definition, there are plenty of definitions of knowledge graph, but you know, the simplest one I want everybody to take home is, is this last one here. The knowledge graph is a simple way of representing human knowledge to machines. This is the basic way, it's not technical. If you can understand it this way, then it can help us to understand the technical part. There are too many definitions out there to make sense. But one of the ones, the most technical one is this one. It's a network graph. Now, I need us to hold that word, network graph, because we're coming to it. Of entities, remember we talked about entities. So your nouns, 
semantic types, your semantic types, different meanings, properties, relationships between entities. How are entities related to one another? How is a man related to a woman? How is bio that they can be related to a mecca? It's very important because that relationship is context. Oh, I see. That's the oh, I see moment. You know, we need to. How is a Mecca Okoye related to artificial intelligence? <laughs> you know, so we need, you know, to understand that, right? Okay, so which are specific to a subject, to a topic, to a domain. So when we say domain, it can be anything. It can be about uh, any medical things. It can be about uh, COVID-19. It could be about, it can be about uh, jollof rice. It could be about anything or organization. So that's what, now look at how data is being rep, uh, represented and look at the word network graph. We are coming to it. A knowledge graph, like I said, is all about representing knowledge for machines or for your agents. Your agents, whether physical or virtual, must use, have where they store knowledge. But we need to capture what human being does and represent it for machines. Remember we said the narrow AI has a problem of being greedy for them to understand few things, okay? This is where knowledge comes from. We also said they don't have background information. Your uh, uh, machine learning does not have common sense. It doesn't have common sense. You need common sense to know basic things. So this is where knowledge graph comes in. So knowledge graph is a database of complex network data. Now network data are what we call interlinked digital sentences. We'll come back to it. Digital sentence is that sentence when you're doing your natural language processing, right? Each of those sentences are digital sentences of real world facts, facts and concepts of a knowledge domain. So if your knowledge domain is about jollof rice, first we have to define that rice is a green. Rice gives carbohydrates. Rice does this, rice is this. Rice is planted on the ground. That is what your knowledge graph is all about. So for any subject. So whether it's about COVID, you describe what COVID is, okay? So knowledge domains are created by subject matter experts. Now it, it gets more interesting. Subject matter experts. So experts in a subject need to share their knowledge so that machines can use that knowledge and mimic our intelligence. Not developers, subject matter experts. So these days now you guys will be listening about no code, low code, or codeless. One of the things pushing this new paradigm is knowledge graph, but is beyond our topic. Knowledge graph is meant in such a way that data scientists and uh, subject matter experts can create knowledge graph, all right? So in a way for machines to form knowledge, so our agents now need to form knowledge about something. So you can ask them, what is this? Remember what we said about the data pyramid? The what, the why, the how, the when, the who. Think about your chat box. So I've just solved your chat box challenge. Your chat box challenge must have the whole data pyramid so that they can ask, answer all the questions. Easy. So if you have done a chat box before, better go back. You see all those hard coding that you are doing? It's easier with a knowledge graph, okay? I've done one with Spacey. All I need was just this Python Spacey library hooked up to a knowledge graph created with semantic technology, boom. A what? I use it to support our software when they have issues on the domain. Remember, we use the word domain. So my software have limited vocabularies. 
So my software manages ATMs for banks. Vocabularies are about the terms used in, 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 in describing the ATMs. So the terms cannot be that much. So when you complain about one of those terms, there's an answer. If you have a problem in one of those terms, there's an answer because the data, information about those things are included in the knowledge graph. And the chatbot is going there to answer on my behalf. I might be sleeping on my bed and my chatbot is answering those questions. If you can't understand this basic description of, then you, can't, you haven't still yet seen how powerful knowledge graphs could be. I just, knowledge graph is what will enable us to take our information, put it on a machine, and, and then tell, you know, put a, 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 a chatbot to it and tell people to ask all the questions. What they don't know, the chatbot will keep those things. And then when I wake up, I answer them and the chatbot will reply. That's knowledge graph. So a knowledge graph represents interlinked description of entities, real world object, events, situations, abstract concepts. So descriptions of formal structure that allows people and computers to process them efficiently. So that structure, we are going to talk and you, you will see all this. Knowledge graph uh, are limited, are not limited to abstract concepts, relations, relations, but can contain instances of things like documents and data sets, okay? A knowledge graph is built on semantics, meaning. So you cannot just throw data. You see what we do sometimes when we do like in deep learning, we are trying to know whether it's a cat. The algorithm doesn't even know it's a cat. It doesn't know. It doesn't even know what type of cat it is. So we are just giving it, you know, vectors for it to, you know, if it's this, then it is this, but it doesn't know. You understand? It doesn't know. That's where semantics comes in. Okay, so semantics is the basis of creating new inferences from data. So if our algorithms can understand what our data is all about, then it can tell us something we don't know about that data. Is the difference between something that generates new knowledge and a database laying dormant, waiting to be queried. So we have all built some MySQL, Postgres database, and we put data inside those database. When we put data inside that database, nothing happens. It's just, it's just there waiting. And then somebody will now come with SQL statement and write a query and then data comes out. What has the database done for you? Nothing. So basically it's garbage in, garbage out. But that's not what we want. If human beings taking the knowledge, what happens? I connect this knowledge with my common sense database in my mind and link them up and I say, oh, I see. I make a connection. <laughs> that is the kind of thinking we want in our software. So that when nothing is happening, our systems are helping us find new things, make new connections. That is artificial intelligence. No, sorry, that's intelligence. Okay, so what is, let's quickly go down because I really want to go into the best practice area so that everybody will now start understanding how it's been applied. But look at what is in, uh, let me break down what a knowledge graph is. So it's a backbone of cognitive and semantic solution. It's a database. The data is in graph format and it has semantics that it has meanings. It's a knowledge base. It uses what we call ontologies. I don't know whether we'll deal with this now. And it has a query engine. It uses a data model to represent knowledge using three principles. One, it encodes knowledge using digital sentences. So all we need to encode knowledge is digital sentence. That is, John is a boy. That's all. That's all in that language. You can even use it Igbo language. You can use Yoruba language. You can use Hausa language. You can use a language. 
to code knowledge graph. If you understand uh, natural language processing, then you, you know what I'm talking about. You can use any language, any natural language spoken by human beings to encode knowledge for machines to understand. You can express background knowledge using a data model we call ontologies. You can reuse knowledge between data sets. Reusing of knowledge is what we human beings do. Knowledge that we have acquired, we can use it so many times. How many of your knowledge has your algorithms acquired that they can reuse? All right. Then we have what we call a sparkle analytics. So this is the analytics. We are not going to deal deep on this, but maybe I'm going to do a, a, a semantic technology uh, advanced semantic technology class someday. Um, and then we'll talk deeper on you know how to build this thing. So, but this is just to expose your minds to say, ah, there's something far more serious going on somewhere. So you can query knowledge graphs. Yeah. The same way you can query subject matter experts. What do you know about this? It is based on knowledge models that can combine the mindset of subject matter experts, data engineers, and information architects. So it provides pattern-based search functionality that can find out uh, unknown linkages and not obvious patterns to give you new insights to your data. Remember, we are massing so much data and we need to be told something new. You understand? We don't need to start searching for it. We need to be known. To be told. It has what we call uh, property paths. Now, this is a bit technical, but in the technologies in storing the data, it's not about rows and columns, it's about paths of true relationships. I'll show you those things. You can define inference rules and gain in, in information from inference. You need to infer your system, your database need to infer. So your standard SQL database and MySQL database is not good enough for what we're about to do. We need database that can make deductions. Deductive database, yeah, it's a big, it's a big deal. So find it out. Okay, so the reasoning, reasoning is key. Anything that has to do with knowledge representation has to have ability to reason. Human minds reason. A bird just flew my window, I just reasoned. What is that bird flying? I already know that there's a big tree nearby. So that's background information. So I'm not surprised because I already have trees somewhere. So I already know, so it's not surprising. Some people, they will be shocked. Like what is this thing doing here? because there's no background information about it, okay? So that's how your database is. You don't want your database to be dormant. A bird just flew by and is just looking, not doing anything. <laughs> Wait, waiting for a query to come, then it throws you out, vomits that same then No, that has no place in artificial intelligence. We need our systems to tell us something new, something we don't know, and all that, okay? Everything we're putting into a database, standard database, we know. <laughs> so there's nothing, it's not like giving you money to keep from me and I'm getting back the money, just security. So reasoning is an agent's ability to verify and discover facts. So linked data provides a body of knowledge, again, a body of knowledge. Digital sentences, or we call them data triples, ontologies, query engines that make us look for specific facts, reasoning, allowing client application to combine knowledge from different sources. Remember our data pyramid is all about data engineering and data science so that we can draw conclusions. Client applications can also infer facts based on other facts. So we can infer facts, but that's what we human beings do. Okay, so a, a summary of knowledge graph is, 
graphs articulate re relationship rich data. Look at this uh, uh, data here. So you look at this relationship richness in this graph. You find out that your rows and column is at the bottom and then graph data is at the top. We are going to reach to there. So graphs articulate relationship rich. We need relationship. How is this data connected to others? Compare graphs with tables. Relationships are what is missing from most data. Yeah, most data don't have anything on relationship. So how do you apply context? And we are talking about intelligence. Intelligence can't work without context, not possible. Okay, uh, describe relationships using graphs so machines can mine them, essential to digitization. Yeah, you understand is relationships create new opportunities of understanding. So that means it changes the whole, you know, the, the whole landscape. Okay, the only way to build works in data is to enrich relationships. You, 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 you create web scale relationships by connecting data from different parts of the world together and being able to see how they are connected. Web scale, but that's a, a different thing to talk about. We, we tend not to use web. So when we model data, we tend to make data very local. It gives us limited opportunities. We should be using the, the, uh, the web fully. Without context, your organizations can't match up to advance analytics or real AI. There's no intelligence without context. Ask any psychologist, okay? So um, now the technology behind the uh, uh, semantic is what you see on the screen. We call it the semantic cake. Uh, I'm just going to briefly you know, go through, it's not part of what we're dealing with, but to have an idea. So we have an abstract language. Abstract language is called the RDF, Resource Description Framework, okay? We use a lot of uh, URIs or URLs or IRI to describe documents. Remember I said web scale. So objects can be created anywhere in the world. We can link them up and use it as our data model for our algorithms. So we have the Sparkle, which is query engine. We have the ontology, which is used to represent the data model used to represent Anything that exists in this world. Then we have the rules, we have the logic, then we have the trust, then we have the user interface. This is what we need to understand now, okay? Now, this is a, 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 a map of Rome. One of the things that gave Roman Empire strength and made them more powerful is that they had well-developed communication channels linking all their com uh, colonies. So, Things can move from one end to another easily. Imagine if we didn't have these roads, we didn't have this communication channel. So people would just be moving, taking longer routes to just move from point A to point B. Why is this thing here? It's because data, for you to know how uh, to, to make uh, powerful use of data, you need to break data to its atom level so that you can enter the data from different routes and be as powerful as the Roman Empire. That's what the semantic technology does. So let's talk on some key concepts. Hyperlink identifies documents or content containers, okay? It, it identifies uh, documents and then what it contains inside. So what it contains inside could be a source of data, yeah. So, and we can use that data that is contained in a container that is somewhere in Russia and do AI. All right. A hyperlink identified concept as a URI, resource identifier, uh, and it can represent any entity, okay? Web page, person, corporation, blah, blah, blah. RDF, which you do it to so provide abstract language of describing entities, okay? Um, to 
store knowledge in a knowledge base or database and perform reasoning, you have to represent the knowledge in a formal language that machines can understand. So machines understand RDF, all right? Um, guys, uh, my, my room is hot. Can you give me one minute? Let me put on my generator, right? One minute. All right. Okay, so now we have ontology language and uh, good. So other thing, uh, we have semantic graph, so a framework for representing data with its relationships as nodes and edges. If some of you have done graph theory, you will have an idea about this. Artificial, not human. So I need us to understand that intelligent in human beings uh, is the same, should be the same thing as in machine. Uh, we've talked about intelligence, ability to apply reasoning and inference to information, logic, formal expression of facts, RDF, abstract language for crafting digital sentences for humans and machine. So we're going to use RDF uh, to create uh, knowledge, okay? Semantic web using machines to make sense out of data and information. So linked data is the underlying uh, <clears throat> technology uh, used for publishing uh, structured data, which has uh, relationships. Um, it's built upon web standard, HTTP, RDF, all this exists, there's nothing new. Look at the graphs on how data is connected. So this is a graph structure. Now, everything that you see that is on cut on a board are entities. They represent something. That's what you call a noun. So whether it's France, city, Paris, Yoyoma, museum, Tabna, is, is they are all called entities. Now we talked about traversing paths, relations. So we are, we are moving, when, when we want to query or look for data, we go through these paths. These paths are the relationships. They are the context, okay? That's how we move. Unlike the rows and, and the columns that we are used to, okay? Now the benefit of this is that linked data breaks down information silos that exist. You know, semantic databases, in semantic databases, the linking of disparate source of data and format enables the inference of new knowledge out of existing facts. So remember we talked about web scale and URLs and all that. It's a way of putting data. Now, let's switch to linguistics so that we can understand what we are about to talk about. Every language, this thing works for every language. So if you're into linguistics, a sentence is three parts, subject, predicate, object. Like you can see here, Sarah is eating apple. This works for most languages in the world. RDF is an abstract language that has the same structure as this linguistic structure. So it is easy for us to turn a digital sentence into a linguistic structure. Okay, so what you are seeing here is what can be represented by RDF, Resource Description Framework. All right, and it's understandable, comprehensible for humans and machines. They understand it well. It's all part of natural language processing. 
So we already know the subject, we know the verb, we know the object, and we store it in a deductive database. So it knows what to do. It's key that we understand this. Remember, what we are doing here, this is the language part that we are saying that intelligence doesn't have. We, are, we speak intelligence. So when I'm speaking to you guys, I'm speaking with subject, uh, verb, and object, or subject, predicate, and object. That's what I'm using to speak. So we see our agents, our AI software can communicate with one another using linguistics. So this is this, an example, France, this is about France. France is of type a populated place. A populated place is already defined somewhere. France has the liberal France. France has capital of Paris. This is a subject predicate object form. Subject predicate object. Subject predicate object. Subject predicate object. Same format. Now let's put it in RDF. This is RDF. In Tunisian, France is a type of populated place. It makes sense to human beings. It makes sense to a machine. France has a label France. France has capital Paris. Paris is a type of populated place. Paris has a label Paris. Populated place is a kind of place. Machines understand this. So I can, from this, I can ask the machine, please tell me what type of places do you know? It will just pick out Paris and France using the label. Again, remember my chatbot example. I put this on a chatbot and it will ask the what, when, why, how questions. This is RDF, okay? This is it. On an entity relationship table, this is the same thing. It's about entity, relationship, entities, relationships. Okay, look at the same thing on a spreadsheet. It doesn't matter where it is stored. I can put this spreadsheet with a URL somewhere in Russia and my algorithms here in Nigeria would, or my chatbot will link to this again, web scale. Remember what I said, web scale. It doesn't matter where the data is. So the data can be produced somewhere else. The data being produced, I have no idea. But an algorithm can understand it because it's in a language that machines understand. Web scale, web scaling. Just to tell you how powerful this could be. So what is a graph? In simple terms. So we write this statement, we send email to people so that they will visit our website and buy our product. But this is how we are representing it as a graph. So we look at the entities, email, person, website, product, and look at the relationship sent, visited. You can only visit a website. Email can be sent to somebody. A person can purchase a product. A product can be sold on. So, you know, I can ask a, from a chat box, I can ask a question, what has been sold or what are you selling? Remember, I can do NLP do a lemma and it will bring up this product and where it's being sold on, website, just like that. I'm just telling you now how easy to create intelligent software. So if I put this data and represent it in graph format 
an algorithm can understand it. It's that simple. If you can whiteboard it, you can graph it. A graph is a visual abstraction that describes how different things are connected. It gets interesting. Let me tell you about semantic modeling. So in semantic modeling, we, we can put rules so that algorithms can work on it. So look at an example of a rule. If both of a person's parents have blue eyes, they will also have blue eyes. So I will create the rule in subject, predicate, object, using RDF and describe this rule. Then a model, a person has eye color, okay? A person, so I create the models of a person. A person has eye color, a person has two parents, a person's father is also a person, and he's the male. Subject, predicate, object. Subject, predicate, object. Subject, predicate, object. Subject, that subject again, person's father, predicate he is male. It's simple. And then facts. James has blue eyes. That's what we have observed. That's the data. James' father is Andrew, and James is a person. These rules can be applied on a person to prove that James' parents who have blue eyes are actually uh, James' uh, parents. So semantic modeling is the same way we think of the real world as human beings, okay? So now look at RDF. So subject, predicate, object, this is how we represent all these you know, nodes or vertices, edge or links. The edges are these lines. That's the links and the edges are this line. Nodes or vertices are these points. This is where your entities is. The edges represent the relationship, okay? Look at how it appears in this format, all right? RDF allows effective data integration for multiple sources. What a lot of data engineers struggles to do, RDF does it easily. So RDF is a tool for data engineers, all right? Now, to tell you how powerful RDF is, RDF may, may mediate between different data models. So on a tabular relationship data, RDF represents it in this subject predicate object. It makes it easy. So we can convert from a table to this. In a taxonomic or tree data, this is a tree or taxonomy. We can represent it in RDF so that algorithms can understand. Now look at, look at the relationship here, vehicle, eh? has subclasses of car, bus, truck. But look at how we represent it here. Vehicle is a thing. Vehicle is a type of thing. Everything in the world is a thing. Car is a subclass of vehicle. Bus is a subclass of vehicle. This is how we represent this structure. Now look at logic for some of you who do logic. You can see it here. Humans are made up of male and female. So we can represent them here as subject, predicate, object. Okay? So we can turn anything to what machines can understand. This is how we represent a string, Leonardo da Vinci, right? We represent it as an entity here. And then we start connecting different entities to it. And those entities will add more context and name the relationships. So we move from Da Vinci from here to this 
This makes a whole lot of sense. You understand Da Vinci more with this than here. Strings are not enough. Strings are not good enough. Context and relationship is everything. Everything about Da Vinci. So simple enough isn't it. From strings to thin, knowledge graphs aims to structure what is known about the world. From powering up search to quick summaries of known entities, it makes information much easier to discover and enables world aware inferences. All right? So this is it, modeling knowledge. This is it, using NLP, semantic triple, subject, predicate, object, the basis of powerful questions and answer system. Remember what I've been saying about uh, question and answer, all right? Now, this is key for everybody to understand. Everybody here needs to understand this graph in front of me right now. This is a relational database. This is a key value database like your MongoDB, and this is your graph database. Now, the, the, the thing is that in the world today, the relational database has a rigid schema. It's not flexible. Yeah, it has high performance for transactions, but it's very poor for deep analytics. You can't transverse paths because there are no paths. Relationships are hard-coded through joins. It's the same thing about this. You can't do deep analytics with this. There are no paths on relationships. But graph database gives it to you flexible schema and you know deep analytics performance for uh, deep analytics. Okay, it's the same thing here. Traditional database store data to efficiently store facts, oh, but relations can be rebuilt with joins and other techniques. And a lot of times. You do your joins in your code. Graph databases stores both facts and relationships between the facts, making certain types of analysis more intuitive. It's too obvious. Okay. Right. So traditional database management does not scale. This is something we have known for like over 20 years. Schemas are what you, that can make you scale. So relationship databases don't treat relation, relational databases don't treat relationship as first class citizens. As a result, most companies are buried in missing relationship data that they need for context, okay? Managing large number of tables soon gets unwieldy. It's unmanageable. Limiting your data resources to tabular method ensures you won't take full advantage of today's compute, networking, and storage. So you see your rows and columns are not enough to establish relationships. So yes, I'm talking to about machine learning. Your rows and columns are not good enough it can be better. Again, this is why we need to combine knowledge representation and machine learning, you know, to achieve AI. Okay, so now we're about to be exposed to best practices. If you look on the screen, you can see uh, uh, the COVID-19 uh, COVID uh, uh, thing that, this is a knowledge graph in finding out uh, drugs that will help reduce the effect of COVID-19, all right? And just to tell you the uh, 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 practical usage of, uh, 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 of, of, you know, knowledge graphs. So you can see here that you can express uh, the COVID uh, pathogen, you know, easily with graph data. You can see the thing that it, it inhibits what it promotes, 
you know, you see that it attaches itself to the lung cell, right? It binds to this and, you know, it's expressed in the lung cell, all right? Now, it's just to tell you that if you are looking for things that can affect, you know, the pathogen, we need to represent them in graphs so that we can know what we need to focus on. Do you understand? This is how we express relationships. So somebody uses this, plays with this, checks in this. This is a friend. You see that this is very intuitive. We can see connections. We can see relationships easily. All right? So these are entities, relationship, married, lives with, okay? And, you know, so it's very easy to do things like if Alice has COVID-19 and he lives with Bob, then most likely Bob will have it. I mean, it's that simple. So you can create those rules. Algorithms understand what live with is or married to. So it's easy. You understand? So with a deductive database, it will automatically know that Bob will be infected or has a higher chance of being infected, okay? Again, look at it, this is graph data. So Julie listens to rock music, Bob listens to rock music, Julie is married to Bob, Bob is a brother of Steve, Bob drives BMW, Bob works for IBM, Jim works for IBM. You know, see how we can express relationships, but you can't do this with relational database. The same thing, this is Tom Hanks. We are talking about movies, you know, Catch Me If You Can, the co-stars in it, of generate this. It's a subclass of this, has this. You can see that it's easy to bring out things that are related to one another. This is how we bring up recommendation uh, uh, system, recommenders, based on connections, relationships, and all that. So graph database, another word for it is called triple stop. It provides a new way to model the world around us. It expresses all this information in simple, single uh, relational structure, which consists of nodes and edges. Where node is an entity, person, place, or concept, or thing, any other thing. Edge is the connection, the relationship between two nodes. For example, a graph of social network might represent people as nodes, communications between them as edges. All right? It's simple. So graph database does that. All right? So now let's talk about best practice. So now we understand what knowledge graph is. We understand that it's all about capturing uh, knowledge from subject matter experts, democratizing knowledge so that everybody in an organization in a place can get access to that knowledge and they can act as well because machines are augmenting human knowledge. So the most valuable companies in the world are using knowledge graphs. Look at them. So if everybody is the most valuable companies are using knowledge graphs, then why are we not using knowledge graphs? All right? This to tell you how important it is. I, we, we know of other uses like Facebook, you know, uses it to keep track of networks of people and their connections. All those giving you what other people are doing on their network is based on their graph technology. Okay. Uh, so they use, they use that uh, as as valuable data points when to build to you know to build social networks. So when they suggest a friend to you, it is because of relationships like this. It is because of relationships like this. This is what every social network uses. Oh, you love BMW. Ah, Bob loves BMW. So Bob might be your friend. You understand? So 
it's clear. Oh, this guy works in a company that looks like yours. And then, you know, he might be your friend. Netflix uses knowledge graph to organize information on its catalog, drawing connections between movies, TV, actors, directors, and producers, and put them together. This helps them to predict what customers might like to watch next and foster that binge watching model of consumption, which has built up his business. is because of these connections. Emeka has watched this. Emeka is your friend. Emeka looks like you. You know, you like science fiction, so you might like this, but I'll show you some of those things. Siemens also use it for their inventory, for their parts, and anything. There's so much you can do with knowledge graph. So basically, this is how we capture and apply knowledge graph. We capture and create human reasoning. We hydrate it with data, uh, data. so we, we mix other data to it. Then we exploit the knowledge. When we exploit the knowledge, we actually create new knowledge. We capture it, we hydrate it with another set of. So it's a vicious cycle. I have my own personal data uh, graph. If you follow me on Twitter, you will know that the way I link up information, especially the things that uh, I've said before, and link it up with new information from my personal graph, I download my Twitter data into my own personal graph and I use it. Most of the things you see in my presentation today, I've tweeted about it. So most of what I bring in my presentation or in my talk or in my conversations come from my own personal graph, all right? So now this is a company's graph. It has a customer's graph to know the relationship, how the customer is linked up to the uh, business, how their product is linked to the business and to the customer, how the supply chain is linked to the product, to the customer, to the business. You need to see, understand, so that you can improve your business. So linkages, relationship matters. This is a COVID-19 uh, knowledge graph or, uh, being used to find answers to COVID-19 uh, data, all right? But the thing about this is that all the data here are located on the web. So they are not local data, not some CSV data brought in, no. They are linked up to data that's been generated in different locations at web scale. So they are using URLs to draw data that has RDF data in it. You get that. So that same way, you can do machine learning with those web scale uh, documents, right? So these are some knowledge graphs, uh, money laundering. So this is for a financial uh, service. They do money laundering, uh, fraud detection, insider threats, recommendation. So they get data from different sources. These are different sources from loans, logs, you know, databases, CRM, trading. And it generates recommendation. They do customer 360. They want to see how a customer is uh, linked to the organization so that they can service the customer well and know when the customer will need something. Okay? And, you know, doing regulatory reporting and all that. All right? So knowledge graph can pick data from different sources, transactional, CRM, you know, and help answer questions. Yeah, so talking of question and answering and semantic search, that is it. You know, chatbots can link to it. And, you know, it makes finding of things easily. It makes onboarding of cost. You know, if you're putting the whole knowledge, the whole DNA of an organization, Inside this database, everybody can use it. You don't need the guy to be able to use a knowledge graph. That knowledge is available. 
Okay, so this is the personal graph. It's very simple. Your parents, your spouse, your children, your profession, you know, simple. But it's never this simple because, you know, you need more information. You know, but this is not to explain a graph. Your real name, your Twitter, your blog, your content, what your content about. Yeah, this is how we create graphs so that we can understand people, understand what they're doing, understand the content they are pushing. Fraud detection is so simple. It's all about relationship. When you are related to a fraudulent guy, most likely you are going to be a fraudulent person. That's the thing, relationship. That's why it's critical. This person is using the same email address with this fraudulent person paid with the same credit card, and that person approved this purchase, then this person must be fraudulent, or this transaction is fraudulent. So you can see how relationship matters. That's why you have to, your mother, remember what your mother told you about, you know, the friends you should be working with, so that we, we can't infer, that's from reasoning, we can't infer that you're as bad as your friends. Human intelligence. Parents. Okay, so we are looking for new pathways in solving disease problem. This is why we need a graph. Relationship. We want to know how we can solve drugs. This, this is how drugs are being created. We talked about recommendation, so relationship. So this is a good example. This person follows sports. This man also follows sports. He purchased this product that this same man that follows sports purchased. So that means this lady that follows sports might purchase this product since these two people exhibit the same thing, semantic relationship. So recommender system will recommend this product to her. The same thing about this. Since this person purchased this and this person knows this and knows this person and this person purchased this product and knows this and she knows this particular person, this social network will recommend you might like this guy and you click, kick, and you people are now friends. It comes from semantic relationship. Relationship, human intelligence. Another recommender. So you just read the news that Boris Johnson has warned Donald Trump to stick to the Iran nuclear deal. Now let's look at the entities. The algorithms or machines Fix out the entities, Boris Johnson, Donald Trump, Iran, nuclear. So it seems that you like this. Boris Johnson is a politician. North Korea is, is another country that looks like Iran, right? Then United States is where Donald Trump is from. Welcome. Mm. You like to read about Iran nuclear deal. So we decide to give you this because Congress has to do with, has to do with a politician, which is what Boris Johnson. So you like to listen to um, what politicians talk about. Sorry. Uh, what have I done? All right. So news the user may also like. So it recommends this to you based on entities. Remember what I said about Rome, different parts to a data. It has made the data powerful. Breaking this news into these entities has just made it powerful. We need to break data to its atomic level. 
so that we can do so many things with it. Again, another recommendation. So from the knowledge graph, this person listened to shape of you. And shape of you is a song by Ed Sheeran, which is of general pop. Okay. Now you interacted with a Tony who also likes a, a song by Ed Sheeran, uh, Ed Sheeran, right? And the genre is also, there's one that has pop and then there's one that has folk. You're okay, because you listen to a song that has that same folk. So the system is generating you two recommendations. It's all about relationships. And this relationship comes from breaking down everything to its atomic level. Now, this is a market knowledge graph. So you want to create a knowledge graph about your market. So everything, your surveys, competitor and intelligence, demographic, data, channel inventory, retail stores, account, local information on your local market. So you are bringing all this data, linking them. There is always link, you link them together so that you can now allow algorithms to deduct and help you answer questions about the market. You get all your data from emails, from your ETL scripts, from Excel sheets connected, scraping from the web, scattered data, all these things to create a mix of data and then getting their relationships and then finding answers. This is how powerful, the same way our human mind works. This is an agricultural knowledge graph. And for me to answer everything in agriculture, I mix up everything. Here we have challenges on soil quality, on emissions, land use, water quality, quantity, everything. For me to answer all these challenges, I need to mix all the data, crop production, animal production, everything, see the individual data, inputs, Oh, wait, the breakout rooms are, what's going on? I, I think the host is trying to um, close them down, sir. Wow, it means the yeah. host is trying to close I, them uh, down. Yeah. So are we going to be returned here? No, no, sir, we'll be returning to the main room. So maybe we should just quickly wrap up, sir. We only have like 20 it's seconds. For this to it's, yes, it's, it's, it's 12 to 2. 12 to 2. Yeah, we are almost there. Um, just showing, um, so this NPRB, uh, they use uh, uh, not to improve um, <clears throat> their services that they give to uh, 